Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining this webinar on the Kappa hierarchy. My name is Jim Morris, and over the next 20 to 30 minutes, I'll take you through the Kappa hierarchy and illustrate how it fits with our investigations and certification program. I will be your webinar host. Just a few words about me. I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for approximately 30 years. I've had roles in quality and manufacturing at several companies. I lead the Excipient Certification Program for NSF International. I lead training and education for our U.S. Pharma Biotech Group. I'm involved in a lot of client-facing activity involving consulting, auditing, and training. I'd like to describe what we'll cover in this webinar. I'll provide some background and context, define the Kappa hierarchy, provide an illustration of its use, and also provide offer some measures to determine whether or not it's successful. First, some context. As I mentioned, this is one element of our investigation certification program. And this webinar is a second part in a two-part series. In June, my colleague Andy Barnett completed a webinar entitled Improving Investigation Report Writing. And this is the second part of the two-part series to cover the Kappa hierarchy. In the June webinar, Andy described the six mandatory elements for an investigation report, and these are listed here. And I will focus on the sixth element, which is the Kappa slash effectiveness check. Less so on effectiveness check, but what I'd like to assure is clear is that we, we unlock the value of all our work via the Kappas that we identify. It's very important to keep that in mind. We do a tremendous amount of work, and it's in this last step that we unlock the value. First, a little baseline setting. It's important to clarify the distinction between corrective action and preventative action. Using the definitions taken directly from ICHQ-10, corrective action is that action taken to eliminate the cause of a detected nonconformity whereas preventative action is that action to eliminate the cause of potential nonconformity. I'd like to use the example of, say, a series of packaging lines where there's been an issue on one line associated with, for instance, the labeler. And that issue is identified, root cause analysis is completed, and action is taken on one of the labelers on one of the pack lines. However, it's clear or it's determined that that labeler is present on other lines, and the, the preventative action would be to look at those lines, look at the labelers on those lines, and take action, that same action, to eliminate the potential for the nonconformity to show up on the other lines. And that would be the preventative action. I hope that's clear. In addition, it's important to, and this is additional information that sets the baseline, it's important to think about the characteristics of a good kappa. And at risk of overusing this acronym, SMART, you should be considering these elements. For instance, your kappa should be very specific. It should ex describe exactly what you're going to do to fix the underlying issue. It should be measurable. It should be achievable. It should be relevant. In other words, there should be very clear linkage between the root cause and your kappa, and it should be timely. There should be a timeline associated with it. It should not take forever. It should be very clear how much time it's going to take. Ideally, as you're developing your kappa, if you keep the SMART acronym in mind, you're going to end up with an item that will be clear, well-documented, and if you hand it, have to hand it off to another individual to carry forward, it's going to be clear to them. So now let's get into the focus of this webinar, the Kappa hierarchy. And you can see from this slide that there are five stops, five tiers, if you will. And as we complete our root cause analysis, often we will find that there are a number of actions that we can take. Our brainstorming sessions will lead us to a series of potential corrective and preventative actions. And what we need to do is assure that we're selecting those actions that are going to give us the greatest chance for success. And our first stop should always be at the top, eliminating. Can we eliminate the error 
from occurring in the first place. Our last stop should be mitigation. In other words, we haven't eliminated anything. The defects are continuing to occur, but all we're, all we're doing is identifying ways that we can catch them and remove them, call them out. In between, we have replacement, facilitation, and detection. And what we want to do is push our way up the hierarchy and select those kappas that are going to give us the greatest chance of success and reduce the risk of reoccurrence. So let me provide some examples of each of these. Our first stop is elimination. Can we eliminate the possibility of error? And this is, as I mentioned, sometimes accomplished by eliminating the task altogether. For instance, let's say you have an issue with recording errors. Well, one action you can take is to link the measurement device directly to a printer to eliminate the, the root cause of the recording errors. Very straightforward. Another example would be where you've got issues with, with sampling for bio burden during upstream manufacture, as an example. Well, you should be challenging whether or not sampling is actually needed at that stage of the process. Is it bringing value? Take an example here described of a solid oral manufacturing process where there's a problem at the mixing stage specifically related to obtaining an adequate sample for blend uniformity testing. We'll challenge the process and determine whether or not sampling at a subsequent stage, at the tabling stage for content uniformity, would be viable and thus eliminate the blend stage sampling. It may not be that straightforward, but it's certainly stepping out of the box and saying, do we really need that sample at the earlier stage? It's feasible. It certainly can be done. Next tier down on the hierarchy is replacement. What we mean by this is to change the current process by replacing it with one that's much more reliable. For instance, replacing human inspection with automated inspection. We know that human inspection has its weaknesses, but it can be solved via automating a process. Or as another example, install bar bar barcode can scanners, excuse me, install barcode scanners in place of visual checking. You can see from this image here, the individual in the warehouse recording some documentation, some information, whereas the individual to the right is scanning a shipper. And clearly, the scanning will obtain much more accurate information than uh, we can ever get recording data. And often, replacement doesn't necessarily mean a capital investment. Sometimes very simple things can be done to replace a task with something that's much more straightforward. For instance, we could be looking at replacing valves, going from a ball valve to a butterfly valve, or replacing forms that we're using to document the process with forms that are um, much better for the documentation purposes. So it's important to think that not all uh, replacement needs to involve a capital investment. Next tier down is facilitation. How can we make the process easier to perform. We need to keep the users in mind at all times. For instance, the redesign of forms so that they're easier to complete would be a, an excellent example. The use of shading, the use of form structure, such that the user will have an easier time completing that form. Techniques such as the visual factory, 5S, color coding, to make um, things more obvious is another way to facilitate a task. Using this example, this image as, a, as an example of that, uh, where we have a visual check on inventory levels, you can see that as the inventory level drops in the bin, uh, the yellow tag appears to indicate it's time to, to reload the bin to replenish the inventory. Many of you would be familiar and are probably using very similar and very simple techniques, Kanban techniques, to make things clear, make things visually apparent, where people know when they need to take action. Next tier down on the Kappa hierarchy is detection. And here we build in a step to double check work. For instance, we may add alarms to flag an out of specification condition. We may add interlocks to stop the process. However, we haven't eliminated the defect from occurring in the first place. We've just come up with a way 
to detect it, flag it up so we can take action. And that's why it's pretty far down on the Kappa hierarchy. And our last stop is mitigation. As I mentioned earlier, here we minimize the effect of the error or defect. We try to catch it after it's occurred. We put double checks on forms. We have double checks in many of our records. We may sort or rework once the event has been caught. But we haven't eliminated the defect. We just come up with a way to deal with it once it has occurred. And that's why this is furthest on the Kappa hierarchy scale. So let's take it and put it into action. Let's apply the Kappa hierarchy. Using this example, I'll read the description of the incident. You can see an individual standing in front of a RABS. For those of you who are familiar with aseptic operations, uh, the restricted barrier, uh, restricted access barrier system is uh, commonly used. And to describe the event, at around 1600 on January 30th, during the glove leak test, glove number three failed post-campaign leak test for campaign XYZ. And a pinhole was found in the thumb of glove number three. Presumably, glove three would be that to the left of the operator that's standing in front of the RABS. Root cause analysis was done, and the root cause of the equipment failure, i.e. pinhole in the glove, was attributed to normal wear from the operators using the gloves throughout the campaign. The gloves are used to maneuver within the RABS to make minor adjustments to the belt, clear vials, and a variety of other tasks. And these repetitive tasks can lead to a pinhole in the thumb of the gloves. Some of you will be well familiar with this type of a situation. Well, if we apply the hierarchy and we work through each of these tiers, and our brainstorming would have uncovered a number of different potential corrective and preventative actions. Our first stop would be perhaps to remove the glove port altogether to eliminate that uh, position number three. I think many of you would pretty quickly think of that as being a pretty dramatic action with some implications. Our next stop would be to consider implementing a much more durable glove. Our third stop would be to consider extending the reach of the glove to make the task easier and put less strain on the glove. Ultimately, we could consider inspecting for pinholes during the campaign. However, I think we'd all appreciate that there's not much you can do once the pinholes are discovered. Or we can mitigate. In other words, we can consider, well, the pinholes will surface. Let's perform some additional environmental monitoring in that region so we have additional data to evaluate the situation and take action. Well, in considering these various potential kappas, we want to push our way up the hierarchy. And that which was selected in this case was to implement a much more durable glove, one that would withstand the, the movement that the operators have to carry out on a routine basis. So that's a, hopefully a, an illustration that is a benefit to you. The benefit of the Kappa hierarchy is that it forces the investigators to think about Kappa robustness right from the start. They use these five tiers and they push their way up. But secondly, it's also really important that reviewers keep the hierarchy in mind. And as they receive investigation reports for review or are involved in the review process, they push back and look for kappas that are further up the hierarchy. So often, what we find is we will gravitate to the simple corrective actions. We will retrain. We may revise SOPs. And what we need to do is really push our way up the hierarchy and look at those kappas that are really, truly going to make a difference. I was involved with a company very recently looking at SOP simplification and running a workshop on SOP simplification. And it turned out that the, a, a very large number of corrective and preventative actions have resulted in action to revise SOPs. It's a very significant, significant percentage. And what they've done over time is essentially added significant complexity to what they're doing with their processes. And it's very difficult to unwind that complexity. So that being said, how do we track our progress? How do we know whether or not this tool, the Kappa hierarchy, is truly bringing value? How do we measure success? 
we're one simple way that we're all essentially doing today, which is to look at kappa effectiveness and determine whether or not the kappas we put in place are truly effective. And that's super valuable and very important. Another is to monitor for deviation reoccurrence. If we look at deviation reoccurrence and specifically look at a trend, and this is for an operation that's involved in biologics manufacturing, the data shows that deviation reoccurrence rates are roughly in the 20% range, just above that. It's a very high number. And just think if we can bring that down to, say, half of that, that, that level, if reoccurrence rates were to drop from the 20% range to the 10% range, just think of the value that's unlocked. And the kappa hierarchy is a straightforward way of unlocking that value. It forces us to think very clearly about the kappas that we're selecting after we've completed root cause analysis. So I'd like to leave you with this thought which is if you really look at this, uh, this image, our mission should be to think about reducing reoccurrence rates. And if we make it our singular focus to, re to reduce repeat deviations, to make it our mission, we will have and make a dramatic impact on our operations. So just a few words. There's some contact information. You can feel free to reach out to me or other members of our team. We conduct a significant amount of training and education, and this is one element of, of our root cause analysis and investig certifi investigator certification program. So feel free to reach out at any time. So thank you. Uh, I have time. We have some time for some questions and answers. If you would submit those, please, via the chat feature. One question that surfaced is whether or not the Kappa hierarchy can be applied to system-related issues, such as with issues of, say, a maintenance management system is the question. Um, this could be applied to that kind of a system-related uh, weakness um, where an investigation reveals that there are problems with the maintenance system. It certainly can be applied in looking at changing up uh, the way in which work orders are handled. It really depends on, on the root cause analysis, but the kappa hierarchy can be applied to system-related issues. Another question uh, that's, that's been raised here is whether or not this uh, kappa hierarchy should be built into a company SOPs. And that's an excellent question. It's a, a good point. It could be uh, built in. It's probably best that it be considered as part of the training program for individuals that are um, going through root cause analysis, and that's where it, it will probably bring the greatest value, but it could also be added to an SOP. Another, another question is whether or not this, this approach can be used for contract manufacturing organizations or, I guess, virtual organizations. And certainly, it can be used in, in that context. Um, it, ultimately, it's a license holder that has responsibility for assuring that investigations uh, and solutions have been found. But uh, this type of, a, of an approach uh, should be used by contract manufacturers and those that are carrying out investigations to identify the most robust CAPAs. So thanks for those questions. I, uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate your attendance. And uh, thanks again. If you have any questions, do feel free to reach out. Uh, you have our contact information. And thank you for your time. Have a great day.